Hello and welcome everybody to OptiWave's webinar on simulating doped fiber amplifiers using OptiSystem. My name is Brian Tipper. I'm the uh, VP of Sales and Marketing here at OptiWave and I'll be sitting alongside uh, your host, Philip Wheatman. Before we begin, I wanted to uh, introduce everybody to the GoToWebinar interface in case you're not already familiar with it. So on the top right hand side, you will uh, see a toolbar with a white arrow and a red box. Um, this arrow will open and close your personal control panel. And at the uh, bottom of the toolbar, you will see a hand icon. Uh, so if at any time during the presentation you'd like to ask a question, please click this icon and uh, Philip will unmute you so that you uh, may speak. At the bottom of the uh, control panel are also question and chat windows. If you'd prefer to type your question privately, you can do so here. Uh, we'll try to answer all questions during the webinar. However, if there are uh, any unanswered questions, we will copy them down and respond to you afterwards via email. Now, during the webinar, we will launch uh, three polls, such as the one you're looking at now. Uh, each poll provides helpful feedback for guiding the presentation, so your participation is greatly appreciated. Lastly, we have three handouts that are available for download. You can access these handouts at any time during the presentation by visiting the handout section of your control panel. So if there are no questions at this time, let me introduce your presenter, uh, photonics research scientist, Philip Wheatman. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Philip Wheatman. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. I know that some of you out on the Western time zones, this is pretty early for you, so we appreciate that you uh, made the effort to come in. and. Today we're just going to give an overview of our dope fiber amplifier suite in OptiSystem. Uh, we've made a number of changes uh, for version 14.2 as we'd like to discuss a little bit about that as well as uh, show you a number of examples. So I don't have too many slides to show you. Uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of a summary of the fibers that we can simulate in OptiSystem and some of the models that we use and some of the areas where we're still uh, performing some development. And then we'll jump right into uh, showing you how to use this on OptiSystem. So here's a, a list of the fibers that we uh, Uh, currently uh, can simulate the uh, erbium, ytterbium, uh, uh, as well as erbium, ytterbium, codote, prosadium, thulium, and holmium. And I just jotted down some typical pump wavelengths and emission wavelengths and some basic uh, applications where you would use this. Okay. So uh, here, here they are listed again. We actually have two types of models uh, called the, uh, we have labeled them as the steady state model and the dynamic model. So here are the models that we, that we have. Uh, you'll notice in, I'll talk about these types of models in a minute. We notice that for the uh, steady state, we, we model all these various effects. You see the dispersion. Raman, the Rayleigh, self phase, and Bruin scattering. For the dynamic uh, models, we're still uh, working on implementing the self phase and the Bruin. Now, if you noticed from our previous version, we did not have a thulium dynamic model as well as holmium model. So these are new, and they were actually a request from uh, one of our users, and we're very appreciative whenever we have users requesting some new functionality for us that we can add in. So those are completely new. You notice we also don't have Prosadium dynamic model, and that's just because nobody's ever requested it. As well, from previous, if you've uh, used versions previous to 14.2, you would have noticed there weren't so many green check marks. We would have, say, the Euterbium would have a couple of the effects, but none of the others would simulate, say, the, the Raman scattering. So we've been uh, working fairly diligently in the last number of months to try and normalize all of our models so that they can all simulate the same things. I'm just going to stop you really quick. Uh, Philip, looks like 
Uh, we have a hand raised uh, from Bashar. I'm just going to unmute him so he can speak here. Okay, go ahead, Bashar. Um, I'm sorry, that was uh, that was a false alarm. I wasn't familiar. <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> well, it's early out there. I can understand. <laughs> okay, right. So these are uh, the, some of the models that uh, that we've been working on. So I just want to. Uh, talk a little bit about, I'm not going to go too much into the theory, we've actually rewritten all of our uh, uh, background documentation as well. So if you if you go into uh, any of our documentation, if you're in the steady state you'll see this, uh, you can link onto our overview of how the steady state works as well as we've got one for the uh, dynamic. But they all, they, they basically work the same way. There's essentially, here's a schematic you see of our doped fiber, very simple schematic. We divide it in along the fiber in position in these grids. You can have inputs going from either side as well as outputs. And basically the way our models work is in a two-stage uh, process. The first stage we actually calculate the gain in these fibers and that's done with uh, knowing what the, uh, from the input powers we uh, we can calculate the gain in here and then once we've done that then we can actually find out what the actual signal is as it exits the fiber just essentially by multiplying it by the gain. The uh, gain is done calculated in a fairly standard manner just using our carrier rate equations. So I've got equation one and two here. So the equation one is the rate equations for the carriers in the various energy states. So this index I uh, denotes the energy state. And, uh, and then equation two is the, uh, you can see we've also got the, uh, the rates of transitions with the carriers. And this is the equation for the optical power. It's given with a slowly varying envelope approximation. So all of our fibers uh, follow these models. So the different types of materials you use, basically the, the, own, the real difference is what are the transition rates that they use. But they all start with this basic equation. So you see we've got the transition rates, what we call here W, and, uh, and then uh, so that's your stimulated transition rates. You've also got this uh, uh, coefficient here A, that'll be your spontaneous, and you've also got your non-radiative recombination rates. So that's what you start with. So if you go into a specific model, it will give you essentially different values of what are your energy levels and what are your transition rates. Okay, so here's the, uh, the transition rate and here is the spontaneous. I just learned how to use the highlighter here. And as well, here's your non-radiative recombination or decay times. So these transition rates are, uh, let me just show you here. Uh, sorry, uh, there we go. Uh, so the transition rates are given by experimental data. So all of our components, we actually have this internally uh, hard-coded into all of our components, typical experimental data for the different materials, and so your transition rates you see is related to your absorption and emission cross-sections. So this is the data that we have actually got hard-coded into all of our components. Uh, so if you, if you go through, I'm not going to go through this whole document in detail, but we talk about uh, what is the difference with the, uh, the steady state uh, and the dynamic uh, models and so if we actually let me just go back up to here for a second so this was your general models the difference between the steady state and the dynamic is in the steady state you're assuming that all the time variations have gone and so you essentially set this derivative to zero so when you set this derivative to zero all of the time dependence goes away so you can imagine that uh, this will actually be a lot quicker to calculate than the dynamic because in the dynamic you keep all the time dependence, so you essentially have to solve this for every time step when you're in a dynamic model, whereas you only have to do it once for the steady state. And of course this would be, uh, you would use a finite difference on the uh, time derivatives. So if you actually, 
uh, go through this, we, we give you a little schematic of uh, the, uh, the algorithm we use to calculate this. We also talk about a number of the other effects, say up conversion, uh, Rayleigh scattering, as well as your Raman and Bruin scattering. And I think finally, we also show you the chromatic dispersion and the cell phase modulation. So the, these documentation documents we've put in are new, and if you're interested in some of the theory, I uh, invite you to go take a look at that. So that's about all I want to say about the background theory. And now I would like to go on to a few of uh, our examples. So I've pre-calculated all the examples just to make sure that so we don't sit here waiting for me to run all the calculations. But generally if you want to find our fibers, we've shown it up here. It's under default. Uh, so here is the directory you go into. Default amplifiers library, optical doped fibers, that's where you'll see all of our doped fibers. And we have also have a, quite a few examples and here is a directory for that. So if you had installed 14.2 uh, and you'd also installed our samples uh, folder, this is where you see, and you see we've got, uh, we've got quite a few of them in there for different types of fibers and in different types of configurations. So I'm going to go through a few of the the, uh, these examples and, and talk about them a little bit here. Okay, so here's our first basic example, erbium doped fiber as you see here and if you double click on this you can see how you can access some of our parameters. So here would be uh, the, the uh, non-radiative transition time is in here, what we call the metastable lifetime. And here is our cross-section time, our, our cross-sections, which I'll, I'll, let me go back to the help here. So if you remember, I said that they're all, all the models are based on the same equations, but what's different about it is the energy levels and the cross sections. And in fact, if you click, oh, let me just show you this again. If you click on any of the help files, uh, the help button in our fibers, you will come down to this. This gives you a list of all the parameters. And each one will give you an energy level diagram. So this is the energy level diagram we use for the erbium. Uh, so here's your main pump energy and your signal. You see your pump actually goes up to one of the higher levels, but the, you've got irradiative recombination, or sorry, the non-radiative are so fast that you can essentially model this as a two-state system. So uh, all of our models, we show this, we'll show the energy diagram, and once you've got this energy diagram, you know these levels, so therefore you can simplify that, that rate equation for the carrier, as we've shown here. So in this case, you're modeling it with just a two-level system. And then we also show you uh, what the cross sections are so that you can the transition rates. So these figures you see in any of our help files are what's actually been hard coded into Opti's system. So you don't have to put in any cross sections uh, in any of our components if you're happy with our experimental uh, the, the experimental data we've used. Of course if you want to use your own you're welcome to it but you don't have to feel obligated to add any extra data files. However, if you do want to add it in, your own cross-section, what you see is, okay, what you see over here is uh, we've, uh, the cross-section file name. So you could actually load it from here if you want. And if you're curious about how those uh, file formats work, we actually also have that in our help file. We discuss uh, let me just scroll down. See, we discuss how these fi file formats work. Uh, so the absorption and the emission cross sections, 
And we also have a number of examples. So if we go back to this EDFA, if you go into the EDFA models and analysis, you see we've got a folder up here called data files. And in here we've actually got some examples of how these formats work. So if you take a look at this, see, so the first uh, column is your wavelength in nanometers and then your absorption cross-section and your emission cross-section. So if you want to use your own files for any of our uh, any of the parameters, you can take a look, refer to our help documentation as well as these examples to see if you've got it in the appropriate format. So there you go, there's uh, some of the basic parameters. And as we mentioned, we've uh, updated a lot of the uh, extra effects and we've got them in both this enhanced tab uh, you see we've got the double colliding, the Rayleigh scattering, Raman, and dispersion effects. And you can enable or disable any of these. As well as under the nonlinear tab, we have the self-phase modulation and the Brillouin scattering. So you can now access this for all of our different uh, types of fibers. So if you just ran this one, you see we've just got a pump laser at 980 uh, CW at, at 1525 and you'd see it come, came out like this. So this is our signal that's been amplified, and then you notice we've also show our amplified spontaneous emission that comes out. You could just make this a little more interesting. You could add in a range of input signals, and then you would get something like this coming out. Uh, there's a, you can also see what's coming out of the back, and, and you see, on the back side, all you have right now is the amplified spontaneous emission coming out. If you'd injected, uh, uh, if you'd injected a signal on the other side, you would see other amplifications coming. Uh, just a side note: if you've never run Opti system before, this is what we call a bidirectional component, and in any of our components, you always have to have an input. So right here is an input, right? And you can't leave that empty because that if OptiSystem will tell you that uh, this input won't, uh, if it's empty, then that component won't run. So that we notice we've got this thing called an electrical null that's connected to it. So if you have zero input, connect a null to it to make sure that the component actually runs. Okay. So you notice that all we have on the lower spectrum analyzer is the ASC coming through. You could, I've just shown you adding in one of the effects. So in this case, I added in the uh, Rayleigh scattering, which is uh, an elastic backscattering. And you notice that when, you, when I ran this, I've already run it, you can see that you actually get some of the signal has been scattered backwards now. Okay, so that's our first basic example with uh, the uh, EDFA. I wanted to show you one of our uh, newer models with the Holmium, which is rather interesting because uh, I've, I've shown you uh, two different cases. This is with uh, the steady state model. And what you notice is you can actually pump it at two different wavelengths here. Okay, uh, so you notice in this case, I'm pumping it with 1,900 nanometers, and in this case, I'm actually pumping it with 1,150 nanometers. And if you actually go to the, uh, the help, you can see why you can do this. Okay, so let me just double-click on the help here. And, the, and if you go down to the energy level diagram of the Holmium, you see there's actually uh, this. Uh, so here's all the non-radiative recombinations and spontaneous transitions that you can have. This is some of the uh, up conversion and down conversions. But on the, uh, on the left side, we've got these little red boxes. This is the uh, transitions you can have. And you notice we've got three different ones that you can use for absorption. 
the W02 and the W14. In fact, those are almost identical energies. So uh, this, in fact, that energy corresponds to uh, the uh, the lower the lower one here, the 1150 nanometers. If you go to uh, so that corresponds to this 1150 nanometers lower wavelength, higher energy. And then the, uh, the upper one corresponds to that other transition. So let me just pull it up again, the W01. So you can actually pump this from both, from these two levels. And let me, uh, so you can just again uh, to reiterate that the, the help files for each of the different uh, types of amplifiers, it, what it will do is it'll specify the energy levels for that particular amplifier, as well as the transition rates to use the cross section. So you see here are your rate equations, but now for these various different energy levels that we've got in our system. And we also show the uh, cross sections. So what you notice is for this one here, uh, the, the top system, that energy is being pumped at the 1900 nanometers, and so that corresponds to this red peak here. So it's actually pumped, and you notice that it's actually being pumped into the same level, the zero one. Uh, of course, since this is a many body system, and you can also have many other effects like uh, Stark and Zeeman splitting. This is not a single energy level, but it's a manifold. So you've got a number of different sublevels. So what you're actually doing when you're pumping it is you're pumping it into the higher energy level energy side of the sublevels, but then the uh, the emission actually happens at around that 1900, but there's also another emission peak. This is at the sort of the lower end of the energy of the sublevels, and so that is where uh, you can see here on the right where these uh, you're pumping with this blue line, and the uh, the emission, a lot of the emission is happening with these, these red lines at these lower energy sublevels. Yes. Uh, okay. Sorry, I have a question about uh, from Sophie about can you include cross relaxation for heavily doped ER fibers? And yes, we actually do have uh, uh, the options. Our e our erbium doped fibers are actually one of our oldest fibers, so we actually have quite a few effects that have been developed over a long time. So I invite you to uh, take a look at that. Uh, and maybe you, if you want, you can email us some questions if you need some help getting that going. But yes, we can definitely do that. Um, uh, and Kaleda had a question about, is it possible to simulate laser line width measurements using an interferometric metric system? So we can measure our laser line widths. Uh, we have some visualizers for that. I don't never set it up in that sort of system. That would be an interesting uh, uh, system to try. If you uh, have any ideas about that or you want to discuss it, again, feel free to email us and we'll uh, take a look at that. So here was the pumping levels for the uh, Holmium, so the two different types of levels. So this was a rather interesting system that you can, you can pump at both of these levels. And this is one of our newer fibers. I wanted to uh, stay on the Holmium for a little while uh, to highlight one of the other questions that we, we commonly get is when would you use a steady state model and when would you use a dynamic model? Because uh, the steady state runs much, much quicker because uh, remember, as I mentioned, you only have to solve it once, that set of rate equations once, whereas in the dynamic, you have to solve it at each, uh, at each time step. So if you can get away with using the steady state, you should. You'll save yourself a lot of time. Uh, so obviously in the steady state, if you just had a CW laser input uh, where it's constant in time, the steady state will work great. But in fact, it also works quite well uh, for the case of small signal modulation. So in this uh, example here, 
I've run it in both the state. I've run the exact same system. So this is a small sig signal modulation here. I've set it up with uh, with the MOX Ender modulator, and I've run it in both using our both our steady state and our dynamic models. And so here you can see what the results look like. So they're very close to each other. So uh, in a small signal case, this would probably be a good candidate to, even though it's dynamic technically because you're changing the, uh, the signal, you could use a steady state and model it quite well. To see why this is so, uh, it, over here I've uh, shown uh, this, what's down below here is the, uh, uh, the population densities in a couple of the carriers. So let me just uh, show you that again, uh, that energy level. So the, the uh, population densities that I am plotting on that one are just for the, the, f the ground state and the first excited state. And what you notice with those uh, carrier densities is they're basically constant in time. So what's happening is th this pa the power that we're sending through this is low enough that essentially the carriers have enough time to recover to their to a steady state system before the next pulse comes through. So that's why in this case the uh, the steady state uh, gives basically the same results as the dynamic case. But that is not always the case. In fact, I want to show you uh, in our next example, I, I'm staying with Holmium, but in this case, uh, I'm going to look at a case when I'm using a, a high power. Okay. So if you take a look, the power that we've got coming, we're inputting here is 50 watts. We're pumping with the 20 watt laser. So this is a very high power and this is a uh, Gaussian pulses that we're sending through. And here you see the difference between what the steady state gives you for the signal and what the dynamic gives you. Right, so in the steady state the gain is assumed to be constant in time and so that's why the pulses are all at the same amplitude, right? But then what you see is in the dynamic case it's going to decay, it decays here and that, that should probably decay all the way to this steady state value. If you, if you kept it going, it would come down and it would go to this level here. So why is this one, why does this one decay and the other one uh, down to this level? And it's basically because the carriers don't have enough time to recover. We've got such a high power, so there's so many carriers that are re recombining that in between pulses there's not enough time for the carriers to recover and you can see that here. So each time there's a drop, this is when there's a recombination has occurred and there hasn't been enough time for it to recover to its previous state so it just keeps dropping and dropping until we get down to a steady state and then here's the ground state, it keeps increasing. So this would be a case when you would need to use the dynamic pulses or the, the dynamic model. All right, so uh, let me go on to our next example. So this was just showing you some of the basic uh, things you can do with, with our models. And the, the main takeaway I, I would like you to actually get from this is when to use the steady state and when to use the dynamic, because that will really make a difference in the length of your calculations. So let's get on to a few uh, more of our examples to show some of the other interesting things we can do. So not only can we just send a signal through and see what happens, but we can also do uh, some other interesting calculations. In this case, what we actually wanted to do was to determine what would be the optimal fiber length for to give us the highest gain. So I don't know if, uh, for those of you who've run our program before, if you've uh, tried out some of our optimizations here. So that's in this tab before you actually calculate. So you what you do is when you hit the run here, you'll notice on the right side we've got something called optimizations. And so if I click on this, 
In this case, we've got a number of different options for optimizations. So what I'm looking at is the single parameter optimization. So let's just take a look at what we've set up. So what you can do is optimize one parameter in your system uh, to one result. And so in this case, what we've chosen for a parameter, and you can choose any of the parameters you like, of course, they may not all work, uh, you know, depending on how your system is set up. But in this case, what we've done is we're optimizing the length of the erbium doped fiber. Uh, and you can see it here. We're optimizing the length parameter of our erbium doped fiber. And the result we're optimizing it to is the gain. And the gain is what we've measured in uh, up above. You see we've got the dual, the dual port WDM analyzer. So, oh, and let me just go back to that for a second. So, if you take a look at this length, what we've done here is we've given it a range that we want it to uh, optimize within. So, the minimum would be 2, so that would be our starting guess, and our maximum is 25. So, I've actually, again, I've pre-run this. And what we found, and let me just try and run it again just to see if it's going to work. So here, you can watch the optimization. It starts the initial guess at 2, calculates its gain, and it goes through, uh, it's probably a newton raphson technique to find the uh, optimal gain. And you see the last one, 17.55, was at this fiber length of 5.51 meters. So that's a way you could use one of our optimizations. I've got another optimization here, which is rather interesting. Oh, let me just show you this one. So in this case, we've got a split band amplifier. We want to amplify signals that are both in the C band and the L band. So here is our input. And essentially half of these will go into C band, and then the other half will go into the L band because they're different, uh, they're different energy ranges. And if you take a look at the uh, the erbium doped fiber profile, uh, the you can see it essentially from the spontaneous uh, emission. So let me just pull this one up because this is a good one to see. And I'll just zoom in over here. You can kind of think of this. This is the uh, uh, spontaneous emission, but you can see how the gain profile works here. So any of the signals that are within this region here are going to be amplified quite a bit more than this. So if you want to, uh, this is a, a way to do it so that you can essentially get a, const, a relatively constant signal, a so relatively constant amplification for all the signals. And the way you do that is you basically you split this, the band here, and you send these through, the, the left ones here through one fiber, and then you send uh, the other ones through the second fiber. And so here we've shown that we split them off this way. And you notice that the, the fibers are different lengths. The one down here is a bit longer because you need to have more amplification, right? Because it's, uh, there's a, a lower gain here. So you have to run this one for longer. So this is a way that you can uh, uh, try and equalize the, uh, The, the gain between the two. So if we take a look what happens outside of this one, okay, let me just zoom back out. You see that um, it's amplified uh, the, a lot of the signals on the left side here, and the one on the right, or the one down below does most of the ones on the right. And then we recombine the signals right here, and you see it looks like this after recombination. Uh, so we, recomb we recombine them here, and then in order to get uh, a flat gain then, essentially what you want to do is just chop it right here, right? And so that's what we, what we, uh, we do, and we use what's called the gain flattening filter. Okay, so here's the gain flattening filter, and if you took a look at this gain flattening filter. 
this is how uh, sorry wrong one this is how you would do it with the trans with the transmission uh, so with transfer functions you would change uh, how much gets through so it chops it off and you see at the end there you go you've cut it off now the problem is that you don't know beforehand how much you have to cut it off uh, how much you have to cut off I mean you can always slice it down lower but then you're going to lose a lot of your gain so we actually use another optimization method and this is one that was designed specially for the gain flattening filter and if you take a look at it in here under optimizations we got the gain flattening filter optimization and if you went into the properties you would see that it's uh, we've got the gain flattening filter is listed here and then under the visualizers it uses our dual port WDIM analyzer again and it's designed specially for this sort of system so there that's another way uh, you can interesting design you can use our fibers oh I, I have a question here from Rajandeep about uh, the purpose for the buffer selector uh, as you see here okay and the reason for this is I don't know if you've done if you've tried any of our bi-directional simulations before what you have to do in order for this thing to converge is you have to have a number of iterations performed okay so let me go to when you actually run the system because it's a bi-directional you have to do it for a number of iterations and that's in the uh, actually this one it looks like it hasn't it wasn't uh, set up uh, maybe I, I've got it on a demonstration mode but normally under these iterations here you would have say more than one right there okay so let's say you had uh, in this case uh, uh, let's say you had four iterations set up okay and then you ran this you don't you want to the, the very last iteration is the one that's the uh, that you're assuming is uh, the one that's being converged so uh, what's happened then is you only want to select that one from your analysis and so you see that's what we've done here that's what the buffer selector does is it chooses the last iteration or any of the iterations you want generally you choose the last one so I hope that uh, answers your question Oh, and I, the, on a related note to that, I see that uh, Radek has asked, uh, can you explain when it's necessary to use the optical delays? And that's actually also um, uh, related to the fact that this is a bidirectional, uh, th this is a bidirectional simulation. So we've got a number of optical delays here. And if you remember right at the beginning of this talk, I told you about how you needed, uh, you can't have any ports that are empty and you see right here we've put in some optical nulls in some of these ones right here because you can't have any ports well you can imagine when you're doing a bi-directional simulation the very first iteration you do there's no signal coming out of here necessarily right and so if there's no signal then there's there, this is an empty input and then the whole simulation will stop because it doesn't this component doesn't see anything so the optical delays are just here uh, basically to tell our components wait for the next iteration to make uh, before you check to see if there's any inputs otherwise just assume it's zero so that's what the uh, the delays are for is when you have a bidirectional simulation okay Okay, so I hope that's answered your questions about uh, that. If you have any more questions about that, uh, uh, I know that the bidirectional can be f fairly tricky to uh, get set up. But, uh, so you're welcome to uh, contact us and we'll uh, help you go through it. Just to jump in quick, Philip, we have a raised hand from Divya. I'm going to okay. uh, unmute you, Divya. Okay. Go Hi, ahead. Divya. Uh, is Divya there? Hello? Okay. Okay, I guess not. <laughs> okay, sorry, we thought we had a, a, a comment. Okay, so there was the uh, 
an example of using our bidirectional simulation with the uh, uh, some optimization. And I just have one final example to show you. This is, we've been uh, interested lately in moving in more into uh, a direction of using uh, some space division multiplexing. You know this is a topic of quite a bit of interest right now. So if you go to, if you start in our default and you click on multimode library, and you take a look at amplifiers, we have the uh, two uh, multi-mode amplifiers, an ytterbium doped one and ytterbium. If there's more interest, we can, we can of course uh, add different materials in the future. We've also got this folder called depreciated, and I just want to show you. This was the old multi-mode fibers, but we basically rewrote them uh, to make them a much more usable uh, for the cases of space division multiplexing. So if you've used, um, if you're interested in the space division multiplexing and you want to uh, try it out on OptiSystem, I recommend you use these new fibers of ours. And uh, so here uh, I'm showing you a couple with the uh, erbium doped multimode fiber. It doesn't have uh, the effects of the Rayleigh scattering as well as these other Bruin and a lot of these other effects. It's basically just solving uh, the rate equations, but it's doing it uh, for, uh, it, it's, it, it's doing it for each uh, uh, in, in space as well. You're dividing the grid up into space. So it works much like our multi-mode fibers. You, get, you uh, specify your core rating, uh, your core radiuses, your cladding thickness, we give you a, diff a couple of different ways that you can specify these things. You get a refractive index profile. And from that, uh, internally in this uh, component, it will calculate the spatial modes of your system. And they will be in, uh, because this is a low index fiber, these will be your, in LP modes. So, What will happen is you will send in some sort of spatial signal. It'll come into our, so we've got some sort of spatial signal that comes in here, okay? And you see I've coupled it with a pump. So this basically, you see the pump here is at 980. So this is our pump and it's also a, a spatial signal. And these come in, I've put them here for now as LP1 in the LP modes, just for simplicity, but we've got a number of different modes. You can use the Laguerre Gaussian or Hermite Gaussian. But all the spatial signals come in here. The uh, erbium doped fiber, the multimode fiber, calculates the uh, various modes that this fiber can support. And then by using overlap integrals, it will convert all the input signals onto uh, the erbium's uh, modes. And then it will perform rate equations on each of these. So, as you can imagine, it does take longer to calculate because you're, all, you're doing it for all the different spatial modes as well. So, what uh, people are very interested in with when you're working with uh, uh, space division multiplexing is in the fiber, can you have a mode dependent gain? Basically, can you, can uh, the gain from each of the different types of modes be about the same? So I'm just giving you an example here. Here's, so we've got two modes that are coming in, an LP01 and an LP11. And the actual types of gain per mode depend very much on how it, this uh, system is actually pumped as well as other things, of course, like fiber profiles and that. In the, this top example, I've actually pumped it with LP01 modes. And then when you take a look when it goes through the system and it's amplified, you take a look over here uh, with our new spatial demultiplexer component, and it shows you uh, the uh, what the power is coming out of your dope fiber. And what you see in this case is the LP01 comes out at a much. Uh, let me just highlight that again. Okay, you see the LP01 comes out at around 18.5 dB and the LP11 comes out at 14.8. And that's because 
when we were actually doing the uh, pumping, we were doing it in the LP01, so it makes sense that the LP01 comes out at a higher power. So you can, uh, what uh, researchers will do is they'll uh, experiment with this, different types of uh, uh, pumping configurations to try and match the, pro uh, the modal gains from each side. It, there's no explicit cladding pumping in, the, in these multi-mode fibers. You could cladding pump if, if you want, but you, the way you would do it is you would actually uh, ha have to choose this, uh, the specific uh, profile that would give you a cladding pump. And so, in fact, I can show you that here. Okay, if you go into our multi-mode, we've got something called mode generators. And you see we've got this donut transverse. So you can see, you can imagine you can make some sort of cladding pump. You'd hook this up to uh, one of our lasers coming in, and you could actually make some sort of cladding pump system, if you like. Uh, down below, so again, so in this case, I pumped it with the LP01. And you see that the LP01 ends up being the higher power. And basically, the reason why this happens is because uh, what you're doing is when you're pumping it in the LP01, is you're co creating uh, carriers in the excited state, and they're distributed spatially in the regions where there will be a higher overlap with LP0, the uh, input signal, which is L of LP01, as opposed to the 1-1. One one. So this you're actually changing the spatial profile of the carrier distribution. Uh, below, I actually, I do, it's the exact same system here and same powers and everything, but what I did was I pumped it with the LP11 instead. And you see when I pump it with the LP11, the, the LP11 in fact has the greater power coming out. So uh, this is the way you could, uh, you could experiment and try and get some sort of flat mode dependent gain. So in fact, why don't I try this? If I, if you say go into your pumping laser, go into uh, spatial effects. Okay, and this tells, so you can see, I've just, for simplicity, I used a fiber LP mode, but you can choose any of these others. But let's say I'm gonna, how about I do, I pump in both. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm pumping in both the LP11 and the LP01. Let's do the same for this one. I'm just curious to see how this will look. Okay. Now, this one will take a little while to calculate. So I'm actually just going to delete this one so we don't have to worry about that time of that one. And I'll just run this. Okay, while this is running, maybe I'll answer another question. Okay, I have a question oh, from Jagan about uh, about our BA, BER test set component. Uh, so I'm not, we haven't done any examples here with the BER test set. There are some that you could actually, uh, you could do for some sort of optical system, but uh, I don't know if we've, uh, we, I don't think we have, For any in-depth questions about this, why don't you just email us? We can uh, talk about that. I'm just yeah. going to pop up this poll really quick, uh, Philip, while uh, we're waiting for the uh, rest of the simulation here. OK, so I actually just ran the simulation here. Uh, but we'll just wait for a sec. I believe there's a poll up. Okay, so the simulation has run, and let me just show you. So remember, here what I did was I actually uh, pumped both modes equally. Now, if you take a look at the powers coming out, we've got 17.22 and almost 17. So you see we've just by, and that's, Basically, as you'd expect, we've got two input signals in the LP01 and the 11, and we're pumping in those exact same modes, so you should expect to get about the same uh, power out from both of those. 
So, of course, you may not, it's uh, inefficient to pump at exactly the same wavelengths all the time. So, uh, sometimes what uh, researchers will do is they'll try and find one or two uh, different modes that you can use that will work for all sorts of different uh, input signals. Anyway, this is uh, one of our newer components. I didn't connect, uh, we actually have multi-mode fibers as well, which I haven't talked about, but you can uh, connect it to that. In fact, I believe I probably haven't. If you go into, if you're interested in the multi-mode, let me see, if I go to our documents, Opti system, our multi-mode systems, uh, we have got a spatial mode. This is actually where I took this example from, and and, and you see it's it's here where we've actually so here was it's just a multi-mode fiber, and then we've got our multi-mode amplifier. So if you're interested in space space mode uh, demultiplexing, you may want to take a look at this. Okay, I think that's. Uh, pretty much it. So um, just thanks everybody for coming. I think have we got all the polls finished now? I see one more coming up. Just this last one, yeah. And also to let everybody know uh, we plan on doing a uh, another OptiSystem uh, webinar next uh, Thursday as well, probably the same time. Um, we also have uh, the recording of this uh, webinar, so if you uh, only caught part of it and uh, you'd like to get the uh, the recording, uh, go ahead and uh, just send us an email to support, and we'll we'll go ahead and send you the link afterwards. And uh, also, um, both uh, Philip and myself will be at uh, OFC in a couple of weeks, so if you'd like to stop by our booth and uh, discuss uh, uh, your simulations in, in further detail, feel free. I think we have maybe one more question that just popped up. Yeah, that's a pretty detailed one. So, uh, Rajendeep, uh, thanks for the question. How about you uh, send us an email and we can talk more about that because uh, that one will take uh, take some thought, I believe. Thanks very much. Okay, I guess that's it. Thanks, everybody. for uh, and uh, Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming. Have a good day.